deterministic laws by um, uh, looking at the world and trying to say how is it completely reproducible and, and in accordance with these universal laws. And what it finds out is that no matter how hard we try, we're actually unable to have a complete description of the universe of that type. And this was such a shock that even as great a scientist as Albert Einstein w was repelled by it. And, and he that's why wrong. he said, you know, God doesn't play dice with the world because he just could not abide it. But I would say, by and large, the majority of physicists today think that uh, Einstein was probably wrong and that actually there is inherent uh, Lawrence, one quick response. Yeah, I guess what on. I want to say is it's not we don't have a go, don't have a complete description. We do. Quantum mechanics, as far as we can tell, is a complete description. We have a complete description of the probabilities. We know with 100% accuracy, if you perform the experiments that was described in the paper that, uh, under your name, that with a distribution, the results will occur with a different uh, with that distribution exactly. And of course, because they did, you were able to write your paper. So to the side, <coughs> excuse me, to the side arguing that against the motion that science, the notion, the motion that science refutes God, is it your position that there are certain things that science can know, and then there are certain things that science can't know, therefore doesn't refute God? But what what is in this world? And as you talked a little bit about this universe of things that science can't handle, uh, explain, such as why we are here. That how large is that category of things that we can't know? And is is, is science just irrelevant to that category of, of knowledge? There are some questions in which um, Christians and religious believers are making factual claims. God made the universe. It's a factual claim. Either he did or he didn't. There is life after death. We may have no way to find out, but that's a factual claim. Either there is or there isn't. Uh, the resurrection happened. Either it did or it didn't. Now, religion also makes moral claims. Um, this is how you should live. This is a happy life, and so on. So religion operates in two domains. The second domain is untouchable by science. Science can try to give accounts of how morality originated, but that's not the same thing as what you should and shouldn't do. Well, um, but just so, be, be more clear about that distinction, because well, I want to go straight to the other side about well, that. Well, science can say that we evolved a desire for cooperation out of Darwinian evolution, mm -hmm. but that doesn't say if there's a famine in Haiti if I should give money or no. So in other words, the content of morality is unaffected by science, although science can give an account of, of the origin of morality. But, but, not, but not the what is actually right or wrong. So yeah, and the other thing... Let me, I, let me, let me, before you move on, let me go to Michael Shermer on that. Well, so um, where do we get our morals from? Um, it, it can't be from the Bible, because almost nobody obeys, certainly not the Old Testament, and, and most of the New Testament. I mean, death yeah. penalty for adultery, there goes half a Congress. I mean, mm. nobody, <laughs> nobody is going to do this. Right, so we pick and choose, we cherry pick from the, the holy books based on something else, something else that's happened that I referenced in my opening statement of there's been this other change that's happened, this secularization of morality. That is, you have to actually have good reasons for why you hold certain moral principles and you, better, and you should be able to articulate them. Uh, and so that's been the, the change there. So even if you and I both listen to the still small voice within to decide what's right or wrong, Dinesh, um, I'm claiming you're not getting it from the Bible, and I'm not either. We're getting it from somewhere else. I think we've evolved this propensity to have moral emotions, and then culture tweaks them, and we've been getting progressively more but, moral. But how, what's telling us what is actually right or wrong? But, but I think science well, does the, tell us what's right and wrong. To sorry, sorry, Lawrence Krauss. Uh, uh, I think science does tell us what's right and wrong in a real way. Really? We, yeah. We, we, we have learned, for example, the, fa the scientific facts that certain animals can suffer, for example, affects our, treat, our decision of, whether, of how we should treat those animals, whether we should eat them or not eat them, uh, or the, the scientific evidence that certain people of certain colors don't have different intellects, different capabilities, has changed the way we deal with other humans. But at bottom, Science has I, determined the way we behave in the modern world. And, and science is telling us what's right or wrong? Yeah, I think so, because wrong. it's telling us how the world actually works. Ian Hutchinson. I don't think it's the case that it tells us right or wrong. I think science does often inform us in ways that help us to implement our morals and our ethics more effectively, more fairly, uh, more accurately, and, and more truly. But in the end, it cannot tell us whether, whether it's right or wrong to do something, because categories of right and wrong aren't scientific categories. Well, the, the Bible certainly doesn't tell us either. Well, you agree? So, yeah, well uh, where do you get it from? Yeah, where do you get it? I mean, does God, does God speak to you and tell you? I'll answer that. First of all, we don't get, none of us, our morality 
from the Bible. It's not like I read the Ten Commandments and went, oh, stealing is wrong. Wow. Didn't know that before. Uh, killing is wrong. Incredible. Exactly. I already knew that. Okay. How did I know it? I knew it because of what Adam Smith calls the impartial spectator, the voice of conscience. So it is the contention of religious believers that the voice of conscience has been implanted in us by God. Now, you say it's come from evolution, and we say it could have been implanted in us by God through evolution. Now, just to say that science tells us facts doesn't mean that science changes our morality. If, if I were to step on the stage and stomp on a dog, there'd be a universal wave of revulsion in the audience, although presumably the matter would be more controversial if it were a cat. Uh, but uh, science... My point is science can tell us the dog feels pain, but the idea that we shouldn't cause pain to others, that's a moral proposition. Science is merely altering the fact which puts that moral principle into motion. So we have widened our circles of morality based upon new facts, and science can provide those, but science isn't actually telling us what's right or wrong at all. I want to go in a moment to you in the audience to take questions, and when we do, I just want to remind you that what the, our format is, we'd like you to raise your hand, I'll call on you, a microphone will be brought to you, we really need you to wait for the microphone so the radio broadcast can hear you, and hold it about this distance, a fist distance from your mouth, we'd appreciate it if you could tell us your name, if you could really ask a question that's on this topic of science refuting God, and if you can be terse. So while we're getting set up for that, um, I want to remind you that we, we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, arguing it out over this motion, Science Refutes God. To the team that is arguing for the motion that Science Refutes God, I want to ask you uh, it's somewhat of a personal question. Uh, can, a, can a scientist believe in God and still be a functioning scientist? Uh, absolutely. There, there are... There are functioning scientists and, and who, who can believe in God. They're functioning scientists who are pedophiles. They're functioning scientists who are... No, I'm serious. I mean, the point is, scientists are human. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But that, not... was a, that, was a, that was a very, very, very rough grouping that you just did. <laughs> well, in the Catholic Church, it's not so different. But... but uh, um... I don't know. I don't know in the spirit of this thing if you want to step back from that. <laughs> okay, but what... Yeah, okay, but what I want to point out is that people can believe people are not fully rational. The point is that no, people I'm asking, can believe... The question people, is, can you be a good scientist and believe in God? As long or, as you don't or, take the God into the laboratory. As a very famous biologist said, when I go into the laboratory, I become an atheist. Because when I, believe, when I twiddle the knobs in my experiment, I don't believe there's some, some angel affecting the results of the experiment. And if I believe that in the laboratory, why should I believe it outside? Some people choose to believe it outside. The minute they take it into the laboratory, they stop being good scientists. But that's, Ian that's, actually quite, that's actually quite contrary to history. I mean, what got modern science going in the first place was a belief in the faithfulness of God, of a creator who'd made a rational creation. And a good case can be made that the reason why science as we know it, modern science, grew up in the West was in part because Christianity in its philosophical and theological viewpoints including you know, the belief in God and in God's faithfulness, served as a kind of a hospitable environment in which that science could grow up. So it's actually not the case that the scientists of history had to say to themselves, I'm going to become an atheist when I go into the lab. Uh, many of them went into the lab precisely because they were not atheists. But I get the sense, though, that the other side is arguing that as science progressed, as the years went by, the more that science developed, and the more that scientists knew, the more tempting atheism became for them because of, because of the volume and because of the discoveries and because they found inconsistencies. What, what, what about that? Uh, do you want to take that to next, to Susan? Well, they, learned, they knew too much after a while. I, I think there's a presumption that science explains the material world, and science does it with material explanations. Just uh, hope, do you agree with that, yes or no? Yeah. Yes, okay. Physical causes have physical effects. Okay, exactly. Go on to that. So, so it is a presumption of modern science, not a proof, but a presumption, that beyond the material world, there is nothing. So take, for example, the fact that as humans, we experience consciousness. We know that there's something in us, consciousness, that can't be reduced 
simply to, to materialism. How do you know that? Hold on a second. No, no. Hold on a second. When you say, how do you know that, you're presuming that it is. Do you agree that the cause of consciousness is not known? The fact that something is not known does not imply it's God. You, you better not get Right, that but knowledge. neither... Ha so, so consciousness is an immaterial thing that may have a material explanation, and the key word is may. And yet you as a scientist believe it does. I don't believe anything. I just want to... You just said that all causes works. are material. I just... I'll wait for the experiments and the theory. Ah, okay. so in other words, in other words, you're, ah. pre you're presuming... <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm simply I'm saying, as a scientist, you are closed off to the possibility of non-material explanations, true or false? No, I told you, if the, if the, if You're the open stars to moved around today, I'd be really thinking there's some intelligence in the universe. There's just never been such an observation. So, and until so, there is, I'll assume the reasonable, logical thing, since there's never been such an observation, there's unlikely to be one. That's all. As a scientist, I can say what's likely and what's unlikely. I don't believe anything. I can say, is this likely or unlikely? That's all. I think this is very important because throughout your book, you, uh, this is called a universe you from hold nothing. It up? I have it right here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I recommend What's the name it. of your book, it's a, very, it, it's a very useful primer on the limits of science. Here's why. <laughs> Absolutely, the so, universe. So, to quote a sample line, and there are many like this, you say, getting something from nothing. And then you say, this is how our universe could have arisen. And then you say, I stress the word could here because we may never have enough empirical information. Next page you say, these are useful operational efforts to describe how our universe might actually have originated. Here's my point. You're invoking coulds and mights and maybes to provide a refutation. Now, even if you were successful in saying that I have an alternative possibility to God, you haven't refuted God. You've simply given an alternative possibility. So you have all these qualifications in the book, but then when you step up here, you act as if science has demonstrated that the universe did in fact come from nothing, whereas you say it never did. You have not made that demonstration I, and you admit it. I think when I was up there, I said it was plausible. And plausible Lawrence is Cross. remarkable because everything that you've talked about in terms of religion is implausible. So the point is that just like with evolution, a simple plausible assumption appears to work is remarkable and we're celebrating. And so the reason I say could and might is because I'm honest. And also because I haven't presumed the answer before I ask the question. Let's go to some questions from you in the audience. Um, right, gentleman in the blue shirt. If you could state your name. Thank you. My name is Jerry Orstrom, and my question is directed to the panelists opposing the motion. Could you respond to Michael Shermer's assertion that, in fact, each of you are atheists 999 times over, and your adoption of Christianity is merely a happenstance of the culture in which you grew up? And does that itself not strain the credibility of your faith itself? Could you respond to that? Well, first of all, in my case, that is flatly untrue because I was born and raised in India, and the majority religion of India is Hinduism. Uh, so, uh, the second largest faith are the Muslims, and then you have the Jains and the Sikhs. So from a very young age, the Christianity in which I was born was problematic and had to be measured against other possibilities. But once you begin to study the other religions, you discover something very interesting, and that is that the... There are shared propositions 